There we go. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, tonight we've got Kira Musa for those who go to the Church of the Nativity. He is a uh, he's a weekly or bi-weekly uh, sermon giver, and um, I attend Church of the Nativity, and I'm always mesmerized by his his sermon. So I figured uh, we would have him come here to Edge. Um, I'm not gonna. Should I give the background? No, I'll let you give the background. Okay. Oh, sorry. The topic is spiritual mentors. Uh, Kira, what is your Hello everyone. Um, so, as you guys know, the theme of today is spiritual mentors, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to have a nice little discussion about this later on. But my hope is that we eventually, by the end of this, can find our own personal spiritual mentors. Today, specifically, I'm going to talk about Saint Anthony, as he's my spiritual mentor, and why I chose him to be my spiritual mentor. My first question to you guys is do you have a mentor in general, whether at work, or like in your careers, whether it is in spirituality or anything like that? Does anyone have a mentor? And if you do, what kind of relationship is that? Is it something where, you know, you just look up to them and I want to be like them and that's what it comes down to? Or is it, you know, I actually have a personal relationship where I can come in and I can actually, you know, talk to them and bounce my ideas off of them and say, hey, this is what I want to do. What do you think? You know, there's a lot of different... Um, relationships you can experience with mentors. And so before I begin, I want to start off kind of talking a little bit about myself because it gives me a little bit of a explanation of why I chose St. Anthony. Um, I grew up in Woodbridge. We weren't very close to the Mississauga Church where there's a church in every corner. Um, and I went to York University and then U of T. And throughout that time, I would go to church weekly. I would serve normally. But there was always something missing in my life. I could say um, you were just kind of going through the motions. And so near the end of my university career, I started to mature a little bit. And I just happened to come across the videos. And I'm sure you guys may have seen it before. Um, have you heard of Father Lazarus? Yeah. yeah. So I, I ended up watching his videos. And I was really mesmerized by the idea of you know this Australian convert that just left the world and moved to Egypt and lives in the desert, lives in a mountain. I'm like, how? Why? So after I finished university, I had some time off before I began my career. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to go to the desert. I'm going to go to St. Anthony's Monastery. I'm going to spend a few days there. And to say that experience was life-changing is an understatement. I got to experience a lot of the monks' day-to-day -day lives. I got to experience why it is they do what they do and just the heart that they have. They were able to teach me a lot about love. And to me, that always boggled my mind because they it's not just brotherly love that they teach. They teach every kind of love, how I need to act with my wife, how I need to act with my neighbors, with strangers. They taught so much. And even though their methods might have all been different, the heart was the same. And so as I was at St. Anthony's Monastery, one of the monks gave me the book, The Life of St. Anthony, which is uh, written by St. Athanasios himself. And that book I ended up reading while I was there, and it was such a wonderful read. I'm not sure, has anyone read The Life of St. Anthony? No, I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. Perfect. Okay, you might know a little bit more than Excellent. So what I found is, like, when you read this book, you get more of a sense of a way of life. It's not a historical book in any sense. It shows you a way of life and what to do. And what I learned was St. Anthony was a great example for myself just the way he dealt with issues, the way he saw life, his perspective of things, it was very different. And I, I really appreciated it. I admired it. So I said, I want to know more. And so as I continued reading, you would get these little stories, these little excerpts. So before I begin with the life of St. Anthony, I'm just going to take a few stories from his life. Um, and hopefully you guys can get a little bit of an understanding of why I chose him. And then afterwards, we can maybe have a little bit of a discussion of our own personal intercessors, or our own personal saints. But the other thing I do want to mention is these saints, they are alive. They are here with us each and every single day. There's actually a story about Pope Krolos back in the days. Um, some of you might know that Pope Krolos, the miracle worker, um, he was very close with St. Mina. And his relationship with St. Mina was not a just, you know, 
say, Mina, please pray for me, and that's it. It was a very personal relationship. He had a mentor-mentee relationship, but it was also a very friendly relationship. So there's one time, um, and, and during this time, uh, this period uh, in Pope Carlos's uh, tenure, it was a very stressful situation. There was a lot going on in the church. And his custom is he goes to liturgy every morning. And so he goes to the church in the morning, and this time, instead of praying the liturgy right away, he was kind of sitting in the corner, listening to the liturgy. He's very solemn, very like, you know, like stone face, as they call it. And all of a sudden, he starts cracking up. And so the deacon around him is like, what happened? Why are you laughing? That's not like you. You don't laugh in church. And so Pope Cross at first is like, no, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. But the deacon was good friends with him. And eventually, he kind of got it out of him. It turns out that Pope Cross was under a lot of stress, and he was talking to St. Mina at the time. And St. Mina kind of gave him a little friendly nudge, and he's like, what are you stressed out about? Like, you know you have us. We have your back. Like, don't worry about it. You'll, we'll, you'll get through it. That's the kind of relationship that he had. That's the kind of relationship that he had with these saints that are still alive. So let's get into the story of St. Anthony and just some things that we can learn from his life. For those of you that know St. Anthony's life, how does it usually start? Does anyone know how it starts off? He was in the church and someone was reading the story about uh, to go to heaven and about the young person that asked the question to Christ. <laughs> and so he was hearing that and so he said to himself, God is saying to my bishop that I have to give everything up and go become a monk. So that is great, but it doesn't actually start there. So when you read the story of St. Anthony, there's a lot that actually builds up before he gets to that point. Um, it actually says um, he grew up, uh, he was born in 251 AD. He had some wealthy parents, and he had a daughter, or a sister, sorry. He had a sister, and they say that at a young age, even though that he was very wealthy and very well off, he didn't really use any of these opportunities that were to him. He was very content with what he had. He, was, he just wanted something simple, he didn't desire big fancy meals or anything like that. And as he grew up, it says that he wasn't rebellious. He actually listened to his parents. He went to church regularly. And specifically, when they talk about uh, listening to scriptures, it would say he listened attentively to the scripture readings, keeping in his heart what was profitable from what he heard. So you're getting a sense of this person before you know going to the church and all that. He's already listening to God. He's opening his heart. And this is something to me that kind of spoke a little bit because what I always used to know was what St. Anthony, you go to the church, you hear this word of God, and that's it, you're changed, you're transformed. But that's not what God is like. God doesn't work like that. And I can't expect that, you know, I'm just going to open the Bible one day and I'm going to find this perfect verse for me and I'm going to change my life because of that. There's a stepwise approach. There's a, there's a growth to it. And so St. Anthony, he was constantly listening to scripture. He constantly opened his heart. And because of that, it's when the time came, he was ready for it. And so then afterwards, as he's walking to the church, as you mentioned, um, he was actually pondering these thoughts. So on his way to church, he was actually saying, oh, I remember the apostles, how they left everything to serve God. And he was thinking of the book of Acts and, and how, you know, the people sold all they had, put it at the feet of the disciples and the apostles and went and served. And so that's what he was thinking about before he even entered the church. So do you notice again, the mindset was well before he actually heard the gospel reading that he was thinking about these things. And so that when the time came, his heart was open, his mind was ready for it, and he was able to act on it. And so we're told that he sells everything that he has, but leaves a little bit left for his sister because both his parents had died and he was kind of responsible for her. And then it continues that he goes back to church, even though after he sold everything, kind of lived a life of poverty, he was going to church still regularly. So he didn't go to the deserts right away. He still was kind of in the world. And as he heard another verse, it says, do not be anxious. Sorry. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. And so at that point, he's like, enough is enough. I am done. You know, I'm not going to keep on worrying about my system. I'm not going to worry about all this other stuff. I need to, if I'm going to do this step, I need to make, be serious about it. And so he gives the rest of his money away, gives his sister to what was similar to a convent back then, and then he decided to live on the outskirts of town. So again, second lesson, when you're going in, when you're investing into something, you be serious about it. That was my second lesson from St. Anthony. 
there's a very interesting story about a priest um, back when he was younger, and he wasn't a priest at that time. Uh, he was fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays and doing all that stuff. And so um, one of his co-workers asked him, like, what are you doing and all this? And he was all happy to explain it. He was very eloquent and like, you know, we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays because of this. The, uh, during this fast, we're abstaining from meats, these ones from fish and meat, and explained it very, very well. Goes into Tim Horton's line the next day. It's a Wednesday, and he orders a double-double. And that same person that he was explaining it to, just right behind him, just pats him on the back, like, oh, so much for that fasting, huh? <laughs> and it was right at that point, that person who was eventually become a priest, he said to himself, like, enough is enough. If I'm going to fast, I need to fast for real. I need to be serious. I need to commit to it. Right? And so St. Anthony, to me, he was teaching me that when he does these things. He was committing to it and he was being serious about it. So when I'm trying to be serious about my spiritual life, I can't go half-half. If I'm going to be serious, I need to be serious. And this applies to everything in life. You know, you can't expect that if you do a job with 50% of your effort that you're going to get 100% outcome. That's not how life works. And so we continue with this. Um, as I said, he goes into the outskirts of town. So he doesn't go directly into the deserts. Um, but as he's in the outskirts of town, he learns from the ascetics. To give you an idea, there were both Christian and Jewish, Jewish ascetics at the time that would live on the outskirts, and they basically just practiced these like righteous lives. So he goes into these outskirts of town, still within reach of the town, and he starts learning from them. So if someone's very you know, humble, I'm going to learn how to be humble. If someone's very smart and wise, I'm going to learn to be wise and smart. If someone's very good at reading the Bible. So he keeps on picking up all these little virtues. And, and it's very interesting how he does it because he does it in a way where he's looking at the good of each person. It's not that when he was deciding to be an ascetic, he's saying the whole world is evil and these people on the outskirts, they're the ones that are okay and I'm going to join them. It wasn't like that. It was, I see the good in these people and I want to take the good from them. Right? This was something that maybe personally for me, was always a struggle because whenever my, comp my competitive side kicks in, it's always, I, it's not I want to be the best, I need to beat the person beside me. <laughs> and, and maybe that's just the way I was raised. And again, when I saw St. Anthony's way of life, it told me, okay, there's a way where I can be competitive and edify God. I can still glorify God in my achievements. And the other thing that was very interesting about this was how he didn't just go straight into the desert. So again, we know him as the person that heard the gospel, went straight into the desert. That's not what happened. His life was actually built on a lot more, where he kind of had a stepwise approach. Sometimes, and especially when I'm first starting in my spiritual journey, I say, you know what, if I'm going to commit to this all the way, I need to go hardcore, and I'm going to you know, go live in a desert for a little while, and then I'm going to be very spiritual, and then I'm going to be close to God. But that's not how it works as well. St. Anthony was teaching us that it's a stepwise approach where you grow and you get better day by day. You grow in your virtues, and it doesn't have to be in a desert. It could be within your work. It could be within your family, your wife, your kids, whoever it is. Around you, you grow your, your monastic life or your spiritual life in that area where, you're, where you are right there and then. And so as he learns all these virtues, he now finally decides he wants to go deeper into the deserts. All right, And there's a lot of stories of how he fights off the demons, um, and I'm going to kind of cut it a little bit short. I'll just share a few stories about uh, his temptations, because again, the temptations and how he fought them really spoke to me on how I should deal with these issues. And being a mentor, he gives you exactly the tools on how we fight these demons. And so we, we learn that as he's um, fighting or after he's learned he's, these virtues, he goes into the deserts. The devil, he doesn't like this. The devil wants to start fighting St. Anthony. And so the first thing that it says is, I'm just going to pull it up. But the devil who hates and envies what is good could not endure to see such resolution in a youth, but endeavored to carry out against him what was his usual practices against others. First, and pay attention to this, he, tries, he tried to lead him away from the ascetic discipline by whispering to him the remembrance of his wealth, the care for his sisters, claims of kindred, love of money, love of glory, and various pleasures of the table, and other indulgences of life. 
And finally, the difficulty and labor of living virtuously. He showed to Anthony the weakness of his body and the many years still ahead of him, and raised in his mind a great dust of debate in the hope of wishing to expel him from his purpose. So with this little excerpt, we see how the devil works. The devil is not very obvious in his attacks. The devil was saying things that weren't necessarily bad. It's like, aren't you worried about your sister? Like, being worried about your family is not a bad thing, right? But the way the devil words it, he wants him to prioritize his family over God. He wants him to prioritize his wealth over God. And so here we see that uh, St. Anthony fights back. And so it says, but when the, en- when the enemy saw himself too weak for Anthony's determination, and that he rather was conquered by Anthony's firmness and was overthrown by Anthony's great faith and unceasing prayer, the devil then put his trust in the weapons of, which are in the navel of the belly, and boasting in them, for they are his first snare for the young. And that's the desert's way of saying uh, the, the devil was attacking with lusts of physical desire. He attacked the young man, disturbing him by night and harassing him by day, so that even onlookers saw the struggle that was, on, that was going on between them. And so, again, this is not just a simple, like, lustful desire. It's the battle is so great that onlookers can actually see this temptation going on. So this is a very strong struggle that St. Anthony is going through. And the devil whispered impure thoughts, and Anthony would defy them with prayer. The devil incited him, but Anthony, as one seeming to blush, would fortify his body with faith, prayers, and fasting. But the wretched devil was determined, and so one night he took the shape of a woman and imitated her acts simply to beguile Anthony. But Anthony's mind, being filled with Christ and the spiritual insight given to him by his soul, quenched the coal of the devil's deceit. So here we see kind of how he fought the devil. So at first it says what? When he was fighting with these temptations, it's faith and prayers, faith, faith, fasting, and prayers. It was those three things. And it's funny because we always say, you know, by fasting and prayer, these people did this. By fasting and prayer, these saints did that. Here again, we're being told that these things work. It's not something that, you know, it's just we're being told and that's it. These are very real things that were happening to him. This is not a person that was made up. And how he defought the devil, how he fought these temptations was through faith, fasting, and prayer. And then the other part was when he would whisper things into his ears. Notice how it said that his focus was on Christ. We have a bad habit of sometimes saying it's not our fault. You know, someone walks by us and we took a look and we let that thought kind of linger in our mind. It wasn't our fault. They passed by me. You know, I I just happened to see it. It's like, no, you can do something about it. You can make an action to hold yourself accountable, to hold yourself responsible. That's what St. Anthony did. So to me, it's when I try to say it's not my fault, this person was, you know, just happened to pass by my, my look and I happened to look at them. No, that's on me. I have to take responsibility and act differently. And so, again, like I said, there's a lot of other temptations that go on. Um, I'm just going to kind of share a couple of other excerpts. So what the devil thought about this. So as the book says that all this was a source of shame for his enemy, for the devil deeming himself like God was now mocked by a young man, and he who boasted himself against the flesh and blood was being put to, put to flight by a man in the flesh. For the Lord was working with Anthony. So again, the Lord was working with Anthony. We see that co-workers in Christ. And it continues to say how St. Anthony, just because he won this battle, it didn't mean he, gets, he got to relax. He actually fortified himself even more, and it says that he starts taking on a more strict um, ascetical life. So part of this is also my view. I think sometimes I beat the devil this one during this one sin. I'm good now, but the devil is smart. He says, okay, he let his guard down. I'm going to come and fight now. I'm going to take another opportunity. So it's the same thing with our spiritual lives. Just because we win one fight doesn't mean it's over. It's something we have to continue to struggle with. It's something we have to continue to fortify ourselves with. That's what St. Anthony was telling us here. And like I said, there's a lot. Uh, I'm just going to end off with one other story of his uh, temptations. This was one of my favorite stories. Um, after a while of these fights, he ends up going into a cave. This cave was back in the days they'd have these caves where they would put the dead bodies in so kind of like a tomb and so he would stay there weeks at a time where one of his friends would come drop off the bread and then see him another week and so with saint anthony he tells him you know you close the door on this tomb and i'm good and so as saint anthony's praying the devil really hates this because the devil knows these tombs in the deserts 
they're places of death. St. Anthony is fighting the devil, but not just that, he's mocking him. He's saying, this is your place of death, I'm going to turn it into a place of life. I'm going to pray in it, I'm going to bring it to life. And so the devil couldn't stand this, because he said, if, the, if St. Anthony can do this now, what is he going to do with the rest of the desert? And we know what happens with the rest of the desert. But it comes to a point where the devil is so mad that he actually physically attacks him to the point of almost death. He's unconscious, he's broken down, he's beaten. And fortunately, that person that kept on bringing his bread, he sees him. And so he grabs him, brings him to the church, and again, St. Anthony cannot move. So all these people that know of St. Anthony, they come and they're praying in the vigil for him, hoping that he comes back. He wakes up. And so in the middle of the night, St. Anthony wakes. And what do you think the first thing St. Anthony says to this gentleman that brought him back? Send me back to the cave. Send me back to the cave. And to me, that always boggled my mind because it's, you were just beaten half to death. Why are you going back to where you're beaten half to death? And so the band brings him and St. Anthony specifically tells him, you close the, close the door on the tomb because it's going to be scary. You might hear things, don't worry about it. And, and I really like what St. Anthony says because it's something that we need to remember when we're fighting the devil as well. I'm just going to pull it up. So he says, Look, here I am, Anthony. I will not run from your blows. Even if you do worse things to me, nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. And he recites the psalm, Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. And so this confused and angered the demons. And so they say enough is enough. And they basically gather together. They turn into these shapes of wild animals and beasts. They gnarl. They're biting at his flesh, like attacking him even more. And what does he do? He mocks him. He says, if you had any power, you, you would, it would have sufficed had one of you come. But since the Lord has made you weak, you attempt to terrify me by numbers. And proof of your weakness is that you take shapes of brute beasts. If you are able and have received power against me, delay not to attack. But if you are unable, why trouble me in vain? For the faith in our Lord is the seal and a wall of safety to us. So again, just the way he responds, if you notice, it's not, I'm stronger than you demons. He always brings it back to God. He always brings it back to Jesus. He says, if you had power by Christ, by God, you could have done this, but you don't. Right? This was the beauty of him. It's everything that he did was always because of God. It's something that we need to remember in our successes. We don't just say, oh, thank God. And in the in back of your head, you're like, I put in all the work. I did all this. No, it's, it's God gave us the power. God gave us everything that we're able to do. And so I'm going to end it off there. But again, to go back to that theme, the spiritual mentors. Why St. Anthony? To me, St. Anthony was the new prototype of a martyr. He didn't die like the other typical martyrs in a lot of ways where it's, you know, worship this statue or else you die. But instead, he died daily. He was martyred on a daily basis when he struggled against the demons. He was beaten half to death by the demons. He fought them, and every day he faced a new struggle, and he sacrificed for these struggles. He would witness his faith and lead by example. And so to me, that really spoke to me in volumes because right now we struggle, we, we can be daily martyred. Every day we have an opportunity to become daily martyred. It's up to us to make that decision. It's up to us to say, I want to be like St. Anthony. I want to be like St. George, like St. Moses, like this, like that. But that's why to me, St. Anthony was my intercessor or my spiritual mentor because he went through struggles that very much I will go through and I continue to go through. And he succeeded. So if I want to be better, I need to look at those who were... That, that came before me that did these things and were able to succeed. And so he, encouraged, he encourages me when I fall to get back up. That's why he's my spiritual mentor. And so part of the discussion, I know we maybe went over time, uh, but let's talk a little bit about other things that maybe you guys feel are very important to you or speak to you a little bit more. Are there any uh, things that come up to mind or come to mind? Yeah. Abel Safin. So why Abel Safin? I don't know. I just like him because he's like powerful. He like whenever I, I'm always like I need help or like I need prayer, mm -hmm. I always say his intercession for Abel Safin. 
that's amazing. And, and, and I love that, that, that power, his strength, his resiliency, right? That's something that you admire about him, that you want from him. That's something that we need to focus on then. It's, I want to be like Abu Sifain. I want to have that strength to succeed, to conquer my demons, my enemies, whatever it is. Anyone else? Any other saints? Baba Krolos. Baba Krolos, that's beautiful. Why Baba Krolos? Why? <laughs> I love him. He always listens to my prayers. He listens to your prayers, and that's beautiful. He's the man of prayers and miracles, right? He is constantly interceding. He's constantly praying. Um, there's actually a story of Pope Krolos one time when he was on the uh, table for surgery because he had, I think it was, he ruptured his appendix. And as they're doing the surgery, because he was so used to praying all the time, constantly, he actually starts reciting the liturgy. He's unconscious, but it's that time of the day he's supposed to be praying the liturgy, and he's reciting it. That's beauty in his prayer. There's beauty in what he's doing, and it's something that I can learn from, that unceasing prayer. That's something that I want to learn from Pope Krolos. Are there any other saints? Yes? Abuna Faltoos. Why Abuna Faltoos? <laughs> uh, yeah. Abuna, I'm not very familiar with Abuna Faltaos. Can you tell me a little bit about him? Maybe he should. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he has so much, so much struggle like, as they mentioned as well. Like, he daily sort of struggles like what, sorry? Daily, so much struggles as they mentioned. Like it's a daily, daily martyrdom, like you were mentioning. Daily martyrdom. Uh, you know, and working hard and struggling to, to live a completely different life than... Mm-hmm. And, and see, that's what we all go through. It's that opportunity to be daily martyred. So we have that opportunity. So that's beautiful. Any other saints? I like this. I like to learn about the saints too. Yes? Yeah, sorry. I actually don't really have an answer, but because I'm like listening to what everyone is saying here, maybe anyone of you can tell me. Like, how did you pinpoint one? I know you gave mm-hmm. your reasons, but I feel like, you know, like to your point that you're saying, you're like, you know, through some of the discussions of prayers and stuff, I just mentioned a whole bunch of that. Hard like, so the one thing I would say is, keep in mind, these saints, they're people, right? They all have their personality traits. They might have things that are similar to you. And that's kind of maybe where you can start. For me, it was through God's grace, you know, I happened to see that video of uh, Father Lazarus, and then that made me kind of go to St. Anthony's mon- Monastery because I knew that's the first monastery in the world. And then it's like going from there, it was a stepwise approach. I got his book, I read his book, I was enamored by the book. And then you keep going from one step to another. Um, there's a lot of saints in that respect, but maybe it's something that you personally struggled with that you found that another saint struggled with. Uh, maybe it's something where, again, you admired someone's strength or resiliency. St. George was tortured for seven years. We know that. We know that maybe when I go through a struggle that I, it's, it's been ongoing and I think there's no hope, what, like, what use is there? It's like, well, I remember St. George went through all of this and he kept on staying persistent. So maybe I need to learn from St. George. Maybe I need to keep going with that. And the more you learn about these saints, the more you get closer with them. Remember, they're all living. It's like building a relationship with anyone. It's as you do that, you start building that relationship. And the beauty of the saints is they help you to go towards God. The end goal is God in the end. All these saints, they're here to help you get there, right? Uh, St. Anthony, he was the father of many monks. His purpose wasn't that everyone looks at him. It's when they look at me, they see God. That's what St. Anthony was wanted. And that's what he did. That's why there's all these saints that came about from his works. Does that make sense or does that answer it a little bit? Hmm? Any other saints? There's one saint that I'm thinking of specifically. That's why. Yes? St. Paul. St. Paul. Which St. Paul? There's a lot of St. Pauls. There's a few St. Pauls. There's Paul the Hermit. There's St. Paul the... Wrote at, uh, wrote the epistles, mm-hmm. and then there's another St. Paul. I'm referring to the St. Paul used to persecute Christians. Yeah. Oh. And then he, he wrote more than half the New Testament. That's amazing. So, and that redemption arc, that arc of, you know, like he was on the exact opposite end, and then he comes back. And not just that, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to be a, a half decent Christian. It's like, I'm going to write half the Bible. <laughs> Right? Like, that's, that's amazing. That idea of you can come back. I actually think of that also with St. Moses the Strong, St. Mary of Egypt. Those saints, to me, they have a very special place in my heart because of that repentance. I love that idea that, you know, 
these people were very deeply entrenched in their sins, but they still got out of it somehow. They still got out of it. There's still a way. There's still hope for me. That's what I see. I don't know how we are how we're doing on time. Yeah. Any other saints? We're done first. Yes. I'm surprised we did not mention any female saints. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> like one of my like uh, there are many saints I yes. mentioned to like from San San Damiana for example. Yes. And San Marina so specifically San 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 Damiana like mm-hmm. one of the uh, remarkable uh, personalities. Mm-hmm. One of the mm-hmm. saints like she she came from a very noble descent. And she was the reason that she helped her father stand in the faith. Yes. So she's the daughter, but she was the one, and the father denied the faith. But because of her, she helped her father repent and go back to the faith. And not only that, but she, despite of her young age, mm-hmm. she she suffered many tortures with perseverance, and she encouraged 40 others mm-hmm. to, to follow her uh, path. And so good That's role it. model. That's a beautiful role model. I actually, the church I used to attend was St. Damiana's Church mm-hmm. in Etobicoke. And one of the things I always remember about St. Damiana is what she sold uh, her father. She says, it would have been better for me to hear of your death than to have heard of you uh, worshiping. And I, I love that because it's back in the days too. Women don't talk back to anyone, <laughs> let alone their fathers. And it's, she's not just talking about, she's almost insulting him. Like, I'd rather you have been dead than to have heard this. Like, that was a very bold statement. She was bold. She was very strong. Like, that doesn't take, that takes a lot of effort to do. Uh, there's also another female saint. I think of uh, St. Macarena the Lesser. I'm not sure if you uh, know of her, but uh, basically St. Basil the Great, the one who wrote the liturgy, that's her, uh, one of her younger siblings. She actually ended up teaching a lot of her siblings um, a lot of their church knowledge, and yet she's very unknown, which I think is beautiful because it's that humility. She had such a humble heart, and she like, literally trained St. Basil the Great, a few bishops. Like All her siblings essentially became very high up in the church. And with her, it's like nobody seems to know who St. Macrina is because of that humility. She's like, I don't care. It's not about me. It's about God. And that's beautiful. So yeah, there's a lot of female saints that we also don't uh, look into, but we need to also as well because there are role models. There are our intercessors. Obviously, St. Mary, you know, uh, humility, something I always think of, I was actually talking with my wife about this. St. Mary's a great example for anyone who's an expecting mother or mother to be. Um, yesterday, our, our little Anthony actually uh, cut himself. And I remember my, my wife was just in tears, like, oh my gosh, he's bleeding. It's the end of the world. And afterwards, when we're talking about this, she was saying, I wonder how St. Mary must have felt, like, you know, with Jesus, holding baby Jesus, like, what if he gets a cut? Is she thinking, like, oh my gosh, this is God, he got a cut, what do I do, what do I do, right? So she must have had so much kind of strength and motherly love and patience. There's so many virtues from St. Mary that we could have learned, or that we can learn from, and that's, again, the beauty of these saints. They help us in our virtues, they help us grow in our virtues, they're alive, they're living. We need to ask for their intercessions. We need to grow with them, and through them, we're able to get to God, right? The important, the important thing is that we get to God. That's the end goal. How do we do it? It's through all these different tools that God provides for us. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much.